Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to have you all here. Thank you for being with us. And welcome to the ninth Annual Eric Hilton Chair Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, before I go any further and get into the formal routine, so to speak, I, we have the 70-story tower, tower uh, Four Seasons Miami, the tallest building south of New York City. And we also have the gentleman in the audience that's the president of that company, uh, Four Seasons, Mr. Wolf Hinks. Would you please stand? <laughs> He's as powerful as that building is. <laughs> and thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Clint Rappole. Some of you may have heard this. I'm a professor emeritus. Uh, the E stands for go. The emeritus stands for deserves to. You put the two together, deserves to go. And some of them, some people would like, want me to deserves to go much sooner than I have, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I would also like to announce that there's an informal session this afternoon from 2.30 to 4 in Barron's. And you're welcome to attend that. It will give you an opportunity to ask questions up front and close of Mr. Ignacio Gomez. So feel free to come in at any time. If you see us talking and having fun, walk right in. If you have to leave early to go to something, uh, please feel free to do that also. I would also like to thank Wendy Gary, Aaron Uzer, and Shannon Burnett for all their hard work in helping us put this together. There's, there are an immense amount of details, and the details are part of our business, and they've handled it exceedingly well and made my job a lot easier. So thank you very much. I would also like to welcome, if I may, uh, Dorothy Nicholson, a former Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Lecturer, and also Mr. Nick Massad. Um, is Nick Massad the third here? I was going to introduce, I guess he's not here. He's working. He's working. He's working at the Four Seasons. <laughs> and, and finally, uh, we're delighted to have Mrs. Christina Gomez joining us this morning. Again, my name's Clint Rappel. I'm pleased to let you know that I've been here 34 years at the Conrad and Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management at the University of Houston. I would also like to give you a brief background on our endowed chairs before I introduce our Eric Hilton Chair Distinguished Lecturer. In 1982, the college was the recipient of a $21,350,000 grant from the Hilton Foundation. And this was given over a 10-year period. Many things were provided by this grant. For example, a 94,000 square foot addition, which is called the South Wing, which houses laboratories, classrooms, offices, public space, the library, the archive, and of course, alumni hall. As important as brick and mortar are, however, it should also be noted that there were four endowments provided our college in that grant. And the four endowed chairs are as follows. The Conrad and Hilton Endowed Chair held by Dr. Ron Nykiel. The Baron Hilton Endowed Chair held by our Dean John Bowen. The Eric Hilton Endowed Chair uh, formerly held by yours truly. We ha also have a Don Hubbs Professorship held by Dr. Stowe Shoemaker. And the first position that we were supposed to actually hire for was a development officer. And a development officer is a euphemistic term for raising money. And the president of the Hilton Foundation, Don Hubbs, told us that's the first person you are to hire out of this endowment. And indeed, that's what we did. We have also had recent success with the addition of the Specs Charitable Foundation Professorship held by Dr. Abbott. This gives us a total of five. An endowed chair, what is it? Well, an endowed chair assists the college in recruiting outstanding faculty to come to our college. It provides the opportunity to develop a standard of excellence that cannot be achieved only through credit hour generation and state funds. It is a way of keeping score with other hotel colleges. For example, how many endowed chairs does another hotel college have? An endowed chair provides salary, benefits, travel, secretarial assistance, 
and graduate assistants. And if there are any grad students in here, they should listen very carefully to that. If managed well, the endowment continues to grow. Today, I believe a chair should be endowed at the $3 million level, although I know many people, and I certainly would say, uh, we would accept one or two million dollar chairs. They're not going to be refused. Uh, I mention all of this to make you aware of how fortunate our young college is to have five endowed chairs. However, it is important that we receive additional endowed chairs in order to maintain our standard of excellence, to keep score, and to remind you of your responsibility and opportunity to help your alma mater become the outstanding college of hotel and restaurant management in the world and someday the universe. You may very well have the ability to provide an endowed chair or influence companies or persons who have that ability during your lifetime. With that preface, please allow me to introduce our Eric Kilton Chair Distinguished Lecturer, Mr. Ignacio Gomez, Regional Vice President and General Manager, Four Seasons Miami. And it's always a privilege and a pleasure to introduce one of our own. Uh, the person in this instance is Mr. Ignacio Gomez, a 1974 graduate of the Conrad and Hilton. At that time it was called a school, we now call it a college, of hotel and restaurant management. Ignacio Gomez was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Our first graduation class was in 1971 with a total of eight graduates. Mr. Gomez graduated in 1974 with a total of 39 graduates and is one of the first, if not the first, international student to graduate from our college. My initial acquaintance with Mr. Gomez commenced almost immediately 1972 or 1973. It was an exciting time for the college for the North Wing was being constructed and we moved into the North Wing in March of 1974, the very year that Mr. Gomez graduated. <clears throat> If I remember correctly, I had Mr. Gomez in food and beverage cost control, a senior level course at that time. I don't recall his grade. I'm sure it was an A. But I do recall well that he was from Bogota, Colombia, was bilingual, and had a mellifluous voice, a Mel Allen voice. For those of you who remember Mel Allen, the voice of the New York Yankees. And those of you who don't, which are most of you, you'll have to listen to Mr. Gomez to see what I mean. <laughs> Upon graduation, he was hired by Hilton International, at, at that time owned by TWA. He attended Hilton International's training program at the Queen E in Montreal. From there, he went to work for Mr. Dave Hoffman, Vice President of Human Resources, as Assistant Director of Human Resources. At that time, the Human Resources Department was housed at the Waldorf Astoria affectionately called the greatest of them all by Conrad Hilton. He worked in human resources for approximately four years. His first operational assignment was Bogota, Colombia for Hilton International. He has traveled the world since then managing some of the finest properties in the world such as the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. He has also been involved in renovations with several properties and was the project leader in the renovation of the Drake Hotel in Chicago, still managed by Hilton International. In 1985-86, Ladbroke acquired Hilton International, and many left Hilton International at that time. In 1992, Mr. Gomez joined Four Seasons as general manager of the Four Seasons Hotel Mexico. In 1997, he was promoted to regional vice president with responsibility for Four Seasons Resort Punta Mita, and Four Seasons Hotel Caracas. His most recent assignment to Miami was as General Manager of Four Seasons Prague and Regional Vice President with the responsibility for Four Seasons Hotel Berlin and Budapest. He celebrated his 10th year with Four Seasons with a move to Miami as General Manager of Four Seasons Miami and Regional Vice President responsible for six additional properties in Central America, South America, and Mexico. I would be remiss if I did not mention persons who assisted in defining his life, his wife Christina, they've been married for 32 years, and his two children, his daughter Alejandra, who worked for J. Walter Thompson in Mexico City, and his son Felipe, who is following his father's footsteps in the hospitality industry. 
Christina, who has accompanied Ignacio, was present for his graduation in 1974, and we are delighted to welcome them back to campus. In my mind's eye, Ignacio Gomez is the consummate hotelier. He has worked for two of the finest hotel companies in the world, Hilton International and Four Seasons. He has lived what many of our students dream about. His success brings pride to our college, and we hope inspiration to all the students, particularly those aspiring to be successful in the lodging industry. His journey has been most impressive, and I am certain you will enjoy this unique story. So, please listen, listen carefully, take notes, for I believe this outstanding hotelier has much to offer in his remarks on his career journey to date in the hospitality industry. Mr. and Mrs. Gomez, thank you for being with us. Would you please welcome warmly one of our very own Mr. Ignacio Gomez. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Clint. Can you hear me? I. Um not sure about this thing about the mellifluous voice. It didn't get me anywhere when I was here. Uh, there were, um, I think there were 38 guys in that graduating class and I was the, uh, I did, the voice didn't do a thing for me anyway. Um, I'm especially pleased to see all the changes. I had not been on campus in 32 years, which is pretty incredible. Uh, but one of, the, one of the most obvious changes is the number of ladies uh, in the audience. And I think that's just terrific. I happen to be managing a hotel where the planning committee, which uh, includes nine people, uh, is a majority female. And I also uh, have two hotel managers in two of the hotels I'm responsible for who are <laughs> ladies. And so I'm delighted that the school has, um, uh, has been able to bring as many of, of you uh, as it has. Nothing wrong with the boys, but it's good to see the ladies around. <laughs> okay. It's a great honor to be here today to speak to you, the future of the hotel industry. Every now and then, I'm invited to speak to a group of students like you, gathered in a lecture hall like this, and I'm instantly transported back to my own days here at the University of Houston. I remember leaders in the industry visiting to tell us of their experiences, encouraging us to pursue a career in the hotel business, and warning us of potential pitfalls and going on about their many successes. Little did I know, more than 30 years later, that the tables would turn. That I'd be standing up here, wanting to inspire you to follow your dreams. Let me tell you something. Start thinking about it now, because when they ask you to hold the attention of 150 students for an hour or so, it could take 30 years or so to come up with enough to say. Today I want to tell you a little bit about my career paths what led me from the Conrad Hilton College to Hilton International and to Four Seasons and my role today. I'll share stories about a couple of the interesting situations I've found myself in during the course of my career. I also <clears throat> want to talk to you about the importance of matching one's own values and beliefs with those of an organization and so I will touch at length on Four Seasons employees to run the finest hotels around the world. After four years at the corporate office in New York, I moved on to operations and worked at a number of Hilton International hotels, starting in Bogota, where I was the rooms division director and later executive assistant manager. In 1981, Hilton International assumed the management of the Drake Chicago, its first hotel in the continental US, and I was transferred there as the executive assistant manager. The hotel had opened in 1920, it had over 600 rooms and more than a dozen different unions. I was put in charge of a multi-million dollar renovation that reduced the room count to about 500. I had no idea what I was doing, let me tell you. <laughs> this was a very, very tough assignment. Um, Dr. Rapol asked me the other day how much money we spent in there and I remember that the original budget was $11 million, but $11 million uh, in 1985 or 86 were rather more than they are today. The final tab came in at about 40 million. But the hotel looked good. <laughs> at the same time, I was introducing Hilton's corporate culture to a hotel that had run independently for 60 years, and that was quite a challenge. 
I then moved to Honolulu and my first resort experience in what was then rated as the top resort in the world. This was an extraordinary place. Oklahoma City was quite a change from Hawaii, but it was my first assignment as general manager, so I went happily. I think I must be the only one who's ever gone happily to Oklahoma City. But um, <laughs> later on, I managed the Caracas Hilton, then on to Cyprus. Uh, again, another very big change. Boston and the Kahala in Honolulu again. The second time around I was the GM, so I dressed for the part. <laughs> each step of the way, each new experience was a building block in preparation for the next assignment. That accumulation of experience is indeed one of the key ingredients for success and something easily dismissed when we're young. Consider, for example, how a young, as a young general manager I might have handled a labor strike in Cyprus if I had not had the exposure to labor unions I had received earlier in Bogota, Chicago, or Honolulu. As it happened, in Cyprus we were caught in the middle of a feud between a right-wing union and a communist union, each of which represented roughly half of the employees in the hotel. More to the point, they represented the political and economic realities of a country I had just landed in and that would be my home for the next few years and I didn't even speak a word of Greek. When they struck, the hotel was running at full occupancy, and over the five days the action lasted, we serviced hundreds of guests with a handful of managers. It was extremely difficult and extremely unpleasant. I can remember my wife helping out in the hotel's laundry for days on end. But experience told me that in a company where we thought of employees as family, a strike would be more like a family quarrel and those fights are usually the worst. So when the strike lifted, I had to set my personal feelings aside. I locked the employee's entrance and had them all come through the main door where I personally welcomed each of them back with a handshake and a thank you. A deep rift between a management team and the hourly staff is a certain recipe for disaster, especially in a service business. So while swallowing your pride is hard to do, it does pay big dividends. Experience had told me that, but also an innate capacity to understand human relationships, which is at the heart of this industry. Today, multicultural sensitivity is something I am sure you learn in school and train further in the workplace. At that time, we could only rely on our personal beliefs. Later, I moved back to the Boston area to open a Vista Hotel. Vista was the name under which Hilton International operated in the United States. Perhaps some of you don't know that the two companies were completely separate companies from 1964 until last week, I think, where they had just uh, changed hands again. But in the United States, Hilton International only had one hotel, that was the Kahala Hilton in Honolulu. And then in the uh, 80s, when it came back into the United States, it could not use the Hilton name, so it was called Vista. Um, this was my first opportunity to open a hotel, which is always a challenging but enormously rewarding assignment. I have since opened many in different parts of the world. If you ever have the opportunity to join a hotel opening, go for it. It is the very best way to gather a great deal of experience in a very short time. An opening is also usually a lot of fun, and in many ways a chance to leave your imprint on something that will likely be there for a very long time. By the late 80s, the mergers and acquisitions fever was in full swing and Hilton International changed hands. And its former culture and beliefs changed quickly. It wasn't long before I was presented with an ethical dilemma. The hotel I was running was going through a cash flow problem and as I reviewed the forecasts, it was obvious that in a few months we would be unable to cover the payroll. In an unusual arrangement, our management agreement provided that any shortfall in working capital would need to be funded by the management company rather than by the owners. When I pointed this out to our corporate offices, I was told that this provision would not be honored. In effect, we would be reneging on a contract. Right then and there, I knew I could not live with that type of thinking and it was time to move on. Believing in my convictions, taking an ethical stance, turned out to be a much better investment. 
I am certain that in the intervening years, the company has gone back to its former values. But I left and joined Four Seasons. Not long before, I had read about Four Seasons in, in Search of Excellence by Tom Peters, the motivational speaker and business management guru. The introduction to the book is about the discoveries Peters and his co-author made in searching out the nation's top companies. He tells the story of how, in the midst of their research, they decided to spend a night at Four Seasons Hotel Washington, but had no reservations. Small parenthesis here. The general manager of that hotel at the time was Mr. Hengst. He was a very, very young man. <laughs> be, be kind to me now. <laughs> Arriving unannounced, they were expecting to get the cold shoulder, but they were delighted and surprised to be greeted by their names at the front desk. The hotel remembered them from a previous stay a year earlier. This is part of the introduction to the book. Quote, for us, one of the main clues to corporate excellence has come to be just such incidents of unusual effort on the part of apparently ordinary employees. When we found not one, but a host of such incidents, we were pretty certain we were on the track of an, exceptionally, of an exceptional situation." Unquote. Over the next 25 years, Peter spent time learning all he could about the company, pointing to Four Seasons time and time again for its excellence as a brand. I had joined a company with core values that were a perfect match with mine. At the heart of everything we do at Four Seasons is the golden rule. That is, to treat others as we wish to be treated ourselves. It's hard to imagine a simpler philosophy and a more effective one. The golden rule is the foundation for every interaction we have with our guests, with each other, with our suppliers, and with the owners of our hotels. When I came to Four Seasons in the early 90s, the company was not what it is today. It only operated hotels in the United States and Canada, with the exception of one hotel in London. But we were doing something special, something never before experienced in the United States. What was our secret? Combining the best of the grand hotel traditions of Europe with North American style friendliness and hospitality. Clearly, it was a recipe for success. When new guests experienced it for the first time, they talked about it. And so our brand took on a certain prominence throughout the US. The acquisition of Regent International Hotels in 1992 catapulted Four Seasons from a North American company to an international one. In keeping with this new effort at globalization, that same year we started the pre-opening work for our new hotel in Mexico City, and I was to be the opening general manager. Adapting to a new corporate culture while creating a business from the ground up in a country that was as new to me as it was to Four Seasons was an interesting challenge. I was given a budget of a million seven hundred thousand dollars to plan, organize, staff, and market the hotel in preparation for opening. I'll never forget that number. It was a tight budget, but with years of Hilton International training in finance behind me, I knew I could do it by watching the dollars like a hawk. On one occasion, as I discussed with my boss the need to cut some corner or other to stay in budget, I was told in no uncertain terms that our only objective was to get the quality right and to forget the budget. This was a major departure from everything I knew until then. I was more than a little surprised, but understood that at Four Seasons, we are never about the pennies. In my 14 years with the company, I have yet to get a call from anybody to question money issues. What do I really mean by that? Well, it is a different corporate culture. Naturally, we need to be about profit to stay in business, but we look at profit only as the third of three Ps. People and product come first. This reflects the very simple but powerful belief that only people who are properly selected, properly trained, properly compensated, and given opportunities to advance can deliver products and services that exceed guest expectations. No one has yet figured out how to make an unhappy employee deliver service with a smile. So our focus is not on the profits, but on who generates the profits, and that's people. A superior workforce will deliver a superior product, and when that happens, profit follows. 
E.C. Sharp, founder and CEO of Four Seasons, says that companies that keep their eye on profit and not on the people who generate the profit are like soccer players who keep their eye on the scoreboard and not on the ball. Which is how, for example, to hire the first 350 employees to open the Mexico Hotel, we interviewed over 7,000 people. And everyone who was eventually employed went through five separate interviews. The obsession with the quality product caused the hotel to earn the AAA five diamonds from its first year of operation. And these people, and that level of quality in the product and service have in turn made the Four Seasons Mexico a very profitable business. The successful opening of that hotel was an accomplishment for us. We as a company were still naive, tiptoeing in international waters. But we learned. I recall the pressure I felt to fall in step with a system where the payment of bribes was not uncommon. One day, I had a call from the hotel's director of engineering who was facing in his office inspectors from some ministry or other. They were demanding, under the guise of some newly invented regulation, that an extensive network of water pipes in the building be painted in blue. They told him, however, <clears throat> that they were perfectly willing to forget the regulation if we paid them a few hundred pesos. Whereupon, I told our engineer to get paint and start painting. A second and third attempts at the same type of extortion were met with the same answer. We will paint. As people learned that we refused to grease their palms, requests of this type eventually stopped completely. And our corporate culture remained intact. As the company has grown into a truly global one since, the lessons learned in Mexico have proved invaluable. Years later, I moved to the Czech Republic to open and operate Four Seasons Hotels in Prague Budapest and Berlin. Like all cities behind the Iron Curtain, Prague did not have a reputation for superlative customer service. Historically, there was no reason for people to develop a service attitude under a system that for 40 years did not motivate them or provide any rewards. Early on, I was told by a Czech friend that under communism, I quote, we pretended to work and they pretended to pay us. On my first visit to Prague, I stayed in what was then billed as the best hotel in the city. In the morning, as I answered a knock on the door to my room, I saw the room attendant. She wore chambermaid's uniform, but with black socks and white open toe sandals. On one hand, she had a can of Coke, and she was engaged in a deep conversation on her cell phone while I held the door for her. The last thing in her mind was work, much less service. If this, was the best, if this was what the best hotel in town offered, I could see what a challenge it would be to staff a couple of world-class hotels with a labor force that felt that way about work. Finding a local human resources director with the proper experience was impossible, so I had to think outside the box. I ended up hiring for the position a physician who specialized in hematology and for years had worked in a children's clinic. After the Velvet Revolution, she had found that funding for research, which was her passion, had dried up, so she sought to join the hotel industry. She says that as a doctor, you develop a great understanding of people and try to help them solve their problems. Well, working as a hotel's human resources director at Four Seasons is exactly the same. And so, in staffing that hotel, we broadened the search to include people outside the hospitality field. Most of our employees had not worked a day in a service business. She knew firsthand that people with vastly different backgrounds could still be a good match <clears throat> as long as they were individuals genuine in their desire to serve others. I remember the very day we opened the hotel, I was sitting in the restaurant. It was a very cold winter day and two local guests walked in. Our hostess took their winter coats and as she was hanging them, she noticed that one of them was missing the loop at the back of the collar. Without checking with anyone, she proceeded to take the coat down to housekeeping where it was promptly and expertly repaired. How simple, yet how thoughtful. Talk about service. I think witnessing that almost brought tears to my eyes. I knew then that the enormous efforts we had made at teaching anticipatory service would indeed pay off. And Czech customers who had never been exposed to real service would now have access to it in their own city. 
That hotel went on to be named number one in Central Europe by Condé Nast and Zagat in its first year, and it has continued to earn accolades ever since. Its restaurant has been named the best in the Czech Republic for five consecutive years. We succeeded in raising the bar by several notches in many areas of product and service, and as competitors emulate us, we make a very tangible and satisfying contribution to that country's economy and to its future. But for me, a greater source of pride is to constantly run into Czech employees at so many of our hotels around the world. Many Czechs have found in Four Seasons the opportunity to grow and to expand their horizons, as have many Mexicans, Turks, Egyptians, Indonesians, etc. Thanks to them, we are able to sustain growth while maintaining very high standards. Our employees become culture carriers. A core group of them at every opening ensure that our culture is transferred quickly and effectively to the many employees hired locally. So that each property, regardless of where in the world, can in fact be recognized from day one as a Four Seasons by our discerning clientele. Today we have 69 properties in 31 countries around the world and counting. Currently there are 30 additional properties under construction or in advanced stages of development in nine additional countries, with many more in the pipeline. When we started out, our brand was less known than Ritz-Carlton. With our ever-expanding global reach, that is not the case today. Has anyone seen Made in Manhattan with Jennifer Lopez? It's set in one of the grand luxury hotels of New York. There's a scene in which the character played by Natasha Richardson discovers that a chambermaid played by Lopez has assumed her identity. In a fit of rage, she claims, this would never have happened at the Four Seasons. <laughs> Anyone read The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen? There are several scenes set at Four Seasons Hotel Philadelphia. Even rapper Nelly is living it up at the top of the Four Seasons in his hit song, Hot in Here. <laughs> With these kinds of pop culture references, and there are many more, clearly the brand has had some impact. Behind the name stands a solid record of operational excellence. Without that, without that, our brand would be meaningless. From day one, our service has been the pillar of our success. Just look at our art campaigns of the past few years. The message is always the same. Let me first point out what you don't see here. There are no inviting landscapes, no alluring luxury suites. What the images depict are what we call exceptional basics, service and value. Guests enjoying exceptional experiences, such experiences delivered by people who above all else truly care. Through thick or thin, good times or bad, service and value are what our customers want. They're enduring needs. As people become more sophisticated about travel, the more they experience the soft touch of the best sheets, the comfort of the highest quality bed, and the scent of top-of-the-line bathroom amenities, they tend to focus more on the basics. The genuine friendliness of the valet, the warm smile of the front desk attendant, the reliability of the concierge, the efficient delivery of room service. Luxury to them is not having to wait. They're willing to trade time, money for time. They're connoisseurs of service. They want every experience to be a peak experience. Value is the sum of all of these things. And they're young. The average age of our customer is 39 years old, dropping from 42 just a few years ago. In recent years, we've noticed that they want this kind of experience no matter what brings them to our hotels, whether for a business trip, a vacation, or a family reunion whether they're traveling alone or with loved ones. They want it whether they're traveling close to home or in Europe, Asia, South America, or the Middle East. So, in order to meet their needs, we've made a promise to them not to change. Promising not to change may sound simple, but it has required a significant effort on our part. It has meant defining and understanding who we are and the philosophy that brought us here. And it has meant that our hiring practices start with carefully matching each new employee with our company's philosophy. That is why we interview people five times. And in every one of our hotels, every single employee is interviewed by the general manager. And people ask, when do you actually have the time to do something like that? And the response is very simple. Not doing it 
is a time waster. Because then you end up attempting to solve all the people problems that are brought about by poor, poor selection process. I believe if you were to approach most of our 30,000 employees around the world, they tell you that making that match isn't a matter of luck. Four Seasons Human Resources strategy is simple. Hire motivated people, train them to be the best they can be, and offer them an environment in which to flourish. The strategy transcends boundaries because it is based on human nature. Ours is a philosophy that is clearly stated and followed to the letter, where every employee has a clear understanding of what we believe in and live by, where people treat each other with the utmost respect and professionalism. At Four Seasons, we make a significant investment in our employees. We hire for attitude, the human element, then spend a lot of time training for skills. This human approach to leadership not only makes for a superb working environment, but it translates into the friendly and inviting atmosphere our guests notice when they enter. A place where employees aren't afraid of doing wrong, but are empowered to do right. It's what keeps our guests coming back for more. The more our guests enjoy this kind of dedication to service, the more they want of it. What is it about Four Seasons that keeps people coming back for more? We believe it's quality. These are the words of famous historian Barbara Tuchman. They sum up what quality means. Quality is the investment of the best skill and effort to produce the finest and most admirable result possible. Quality is achieving or reaching for the highest standard as against being satisfied with the sloppy or fraudulent. It is honesty of purpose as against catering to the cheap or sensational sentiment. It does not compromise with the second rate. Tom Peters, whom I mentioned earlier and who has been a loyal guest since 1979, wrote to our chairman recently. I quote, I know Four Seasons accolades are common as dirt, but how can one more hurt? As someone who has traveled 200 nights a year for 29 years, hotels are of more than passing interest. I've had the privilege to stay in some of the world's finest, but nothing truly compares with the Four Seasons. Despite growth that blunts for many companies the personal touch, you and your colleagues have almost miraculously managed to maintain it. I wish to thank you for simply having made my life on the road far more tolerable, even more pleasant than it might have been. Truth be known, sometimes I stay at Four Seasons an extra day just to wind down and get my bearings amidst the madness of life." Unquote. Today I am responsible for our properties in Miami, a beautiful resort in Exuma in the Bahamas, another resort on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica uh, in the uh, Papagayo Peninsula, my old stomping grounds in Mexico City, uh, another lovely resort in Uruguay on the shores of the River Plate across from Argentina, uh, a great hotel in downtown Buenos Aires, and another fabulous resort in Punta Mita in Mexico. They keep me busy, but I continue to love the hotel business with the same passion I felt when I was in college. You'll remember when I found Four Seasons, I found a company with a philosophy that was a perfect match with mine. This is what I advise you do. Join a company that mirrors your values and which is willing to make a significant investment in people. Join a company you will be proud to represent and be a part of, and one where you can afford to stand here and have your boss around and be proud of him. Remember that when you do my performance review, eh? <laughs> I had all that at Hilton International, and I live by it at Four Seasons. I believe such a match is integral to success. I also believe that taking an ethical stance will always prove rewarding at the end. I could have decided to grease a few palms in Mexico City to make a problem disappear, but the seemingly difficult path usually pro proves easiest in the long run. Dr. Rapol asked me uh, a few months back to speak to you about uh, success and, and the manner in which he explained it was uh, in food and beverage terms. He said, do you have a recipe for success? Well, my answer is I don't have a recipe for success. 
But I can tell you that there is no substitute for hard work and commitment. You should add to that a dose of common sense, a love of people, a bit of luck, and perhaps a mentor. Experience comes with making hundreds of mistakes along the way. You should add a few more by becoming part of a hotel opening. Finally, <clears throat> I would tell you that the theoretical foundation you are developing today is certain to make your path a lot easier. So get as much out of your classes as you possibly can. I thank you for being here today and wish you good luck with your future career. And I hope to see at least some of you at Four Seasons one day. Thank you. How are we doing with time? I want to comment. Uh, I asked Mr. Gomez to speak for 35 minutes, and he has hit the nail on the head. <laughs> and there's room for questions, so please feel free to ask Mr. Gomez questions. Yes. Most difficult decision you've ever made in hospitality industry. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is a huge question. This. You know, you, you, your life in management is a succession of decisions. You can always go back and revisit every, every other thing that you've done. But um, decisions about people are always the most critical ones. And, uh, and just as we, uh, just as we uh, take such care in selecting and training, compensating, doing all these things that we do, we also make mistakes. And when you make mistakes <clears throat> in, in the selection process, you also need to be able to correct them. Those are very difficult decisions to make, but they must be made. So I can't think of one particular instance, but I can think of several uh, situations where you have had to make decisions about people's lives for the better of the organization, but also for, for, their, own, for their own good. Anything else? Well, I speak, uh, I speak French, uh, uh, some Spanish still. Um, and uh, and uh, that 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 helped me in 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 Cyprus. Uh, the Greek was a challenge, obviously, because you had to start by learning the uh, the Greek alphabet, which uh, obviously is different from from the Latin. And uh, but but you also find um, relatively quickly that there are enormous number of, of Greek roots to English and, and to every other language, really. So. Uh, at least uh, you, you begin to understand things. What I, the way I worked in Cyprus, I used to have the uh, director of public relations of the hotel come in every day with a translation of all the newspaper clippings where the hotel was mentioned so that I understood where we stood. Where, when, when we had, uh, uh, er, very early on, the meetings with the unions, for example, we had the two union heads and our lawyer, and although they spoke perfect English, part of the game was not to speak English, obviously, so the lawyer translated. What became extremely complicated there, uh, now that I'm remembering the story, is that we would sit there at 9 o'clock in the morning and negotiate for four or five, six hours, and we would decide one of 20 issues, or agree upon one of 20 issues. And the following day, I would go and look at the newspapers, <coughs> And it was a completely different story. And of course, nobody had called me to get the company side of the story. It was the union side. So I started calling the editors of the uh, major newspapers. And the standard answer was, well, you know what, Mr. Gomez, the, we work with the same union, so we really print what they tell us. And what that reminded me of is how lucky we are in this country and how, how often we do not think of the importance of having a free press and of the impact that this has on, on things. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, I had an interpreter take me by the hand in the first few months. Um, uh, the Czech language is unbelievably difficult. It has 42, uh, 42 letters in the alphabet to begin with, and so uh, every other consonant can be pronounced in five different ways, depending on the little stick on the side or above or whatever. So it was, it was extremely difficult. But, uh, but uh, since part of the hiring process that we have is that we require our employees to speak English, because the majority of our guests uh, do speak English, uh, that made the process a little, a little easier. Any? Yes? So, um, you stated that your, one of your first jobs was um, in the room division. Right. Uh, 
Um, do you find it hard to change from one of, uh, department to the other? Or how was the transition continue as a general I was very lucky because I, I skipped um, a lot of those steps that are typical in, 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 in the career uh, uh, because the, the training program that Hilton International had at the time was so highly uh, concentrated and so well put together that, that you actually had an opportunity to learn quite a bit as, as, as you went through as a management trainee. That never really replaces the actual experience of of managing a group of employees. So I think that what we do today is much more valuable. But, but, but it worked for me. Uh, so I can't argue uh, with, with what happened there. Uh, I, I think that today, if I have a, a decision to make about appointing a rooms division director, I clearly would have, all, 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 all things being equal, I clearly would rather see somebody who has managed the concierge department, who has managed the front, who has managed the front desk, and who has been in housekeeping, for sure because you want uh, as much experience as you can possibly get uh, as, as you go up. Anyone, anyone else? Yes? your favorite place to live in Well, Honolulu is hard to beat. Uh, <laughs> although, although every single place um, has been uh, an experience in itself. And I think that the, um, this multiculturality that, uh, that one gathers by um, the luck that we've had living in so many different parts of the world uh, is something that stands people very well in the world today because the world shrinks every day. The more empathy we have for, for everybody else, I think the better off we're going to be. The Czech Republic was an extraordinary experience. Um, you know, to, to set up a business and, uh, and uh, actually run it in a country that is just coming out of such an unbelievably difficult period in history uh, was a huge challenge. For one thing, <clears throat> the legal system was still very wobbly. You just came from 40 years of, of a totalitarian system where the rules were given to you uh, to one where everybody's trying to find their way and inventing uh, the way. And so now you're setting up business in that environment. That was, uh, that was quite a challenge. But it's probably the most beautiful city in Europe, perhaps next to Paris. And it is the only European capital that was not damaged in any way by either war. So although the communists did not damage it either, they, 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 didn't, they, they didn't maintain it. When they went away, um, when the system fell, it was just a matter of, of painting and, and, and cleaning up, and, and the city just came back. It's like, uh, it's like a dream. Uh, and it is almost precisely in the center of Europe. So when you live there, you have a great opportunity to, to travel very, you know, Austria, Hungary, Germany, France, and so on. Every, everything is close by. Um, from the standpoint of my family, my children, uh, I, I think that they are uh, who they are in great measure because of all these experiences that they've lived in. And granted, whereas it might have been very difficult to go through 10 or, diff 10 or 12 different schools in your life, it, it, it's the complete opposite of what most people do. That in itself became a, a, a great lesson in life. And, uh, and of course, they speak the languages and they, they're citizens of the world, which is really what you want to be, particularly in this industry. Any other question? Yes, Nick. Can you tell us a little bit more about your hotel in Miami? Uh, that's, uh, th that hotel is... Uh, that hotel, I think, represents rather well what the hotel industry, at least at our level of, of the industry, is, is going toward, and that is a mixed-use building. So the hotel, although uh, the building is 70 stories, as Clint mentioned, um, the hotel only occupies 10 floors of that. Uh, however, in order for that hotel to be developed, because of the, of the enormous development cost of any hotel today, uh, uh, in our niche of the market, the only way in which you can pen make the numbers pencil out is by is by um, adding a residential component or several other components. And so, uh, the first 20 floors of the hotel are uh, of the building are a hotel. The next 10 are a condominium hotel, which are really uh, hotel suites decorated and furnished and finished exactly like the hotels uh, suites are. But people purchase them, and they either live in them or they give them back to the hotel, and the hotel rents them through a rental program. 
And above that, from floors 40 to 70, there are 184 outright condominiums that are sold to, uh, uh, to people who wish to live in them, and then they finish them any way they like. They have separate entrance and so on. The building has 26 elevators. Uh, and uh, it is designed in such a way that if you own the penthouse uh, and really are not obviously a guest to the hotel, uh, you can still call room service and get your breakfast up there with room service and we're able to deliver it as though you were a guest to the hotel if you want housekeeping services and so on. And that is a formula that we use probably in, in 10 or 8 of our operating hotels today. And I think that if you were to look at the hotels that we're developing going forward, there's hardly any of them that don't have some type of residential component or some such uh, additional mixed use uh, built into it because, again, uh, it is exceedingly uh, expensive to build these things. Our hotel in Washington, D.C. just sold yesterday, I read in the papers, uh, uh, that is one owner sells it to another, of course, it just continues to operate, of course. But that hotel sold for uh, the equivalent of $600,000 a room. So you can imagine building that same product today nominally would cost $600,000 a room. By the old rule of thumb that I'm sure you've heard, that would mean that you would require an average rate of $600 at about 70% occupancy to make ends meet. It is uh, staggering. Having said that, that hotel will probably very likely be at a $600 average rate in a couple of years because it is the type of product that, that we have there. Yes? Very painfully. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a very, very, very difficult experience, particularly because the strike really was not uh, about management. It was, a, it was a, a fight between the two unions, and the hotel uh, uh, got caught in the middle. And I had just arrived. It was, uh, I don't think I had been there two months uh, when this happened. So that made it even more, more challenging. But we had a team of probably 15 managers who, uh, uh, who were able to stay in because we had to lock the employees out as well. So with about 15 people, that hotel had, I believe, 270 rooms. And it must have been running at 80% occupancy. So you had probably three, 400 guests uh, in the building being serviced by 14 or 15 people. As I mentioned, Christina ended up uh, folding towels in the laundry for, for weeks on end. And I think even my children were helping out because you, know, you don't have a choice. The guests are still there, and you have to service them. It is something that, uh, that you never really want to be involved with. Um, but the point of my story really was about if and when this happens, how do you <coughs> limit the damage? Because those 15 managers who stayed behind uh, felt extremely insulted and slighted by the fact that the people that were working with them yesterday left them out you know, to handle this disaster with the guests. And so that by returning, uh, the, by the time that the employees returned, you could not afford not to have a, a, a welcoming atmosphere. Because if you maintain that, that antagonistic attitude between management and, 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 and employees, you, know, you might as well give up the ship. You just cannot run a hotel like that. Any other question? One yes. Last question. Um, what will drive a company like Four Seasons to leave a country and expand elsewhere as it happened in Caracas? Well, we, we haven't left Caracas. We, we, uh, we have had a, uh, a, uh, a dispute with the people who built the hotel because they never finished it properly. Part of their contract, in fact, at the heart of any management contract is you must deliver the products that we can operate uh, as a forces hotel. Well, they never did. And, uh, and so the hotel is still a forces hotel. It remains closed. And uh, we are dealing through the courts on this. It's a very, very unusual situation for Four Seasons. I think it is the only, the first and only time in 40 years that we have had any kind of, a, of an issue with an owner. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Wolf, I'm not as, as up on it as, as I might be, but uh, that, that's really the story. Now, so we're not leaving Venezuela or have not left Venezuela. Occasionally, we find that a building, a product, 
uh, reaches a point where the owners cannot maintain it to, to the standard that the brand requires and, uh, and or we finish the very long period of the contract which usually is uh, uh, in increments of 20 years. The average contract for us, the average management contract is about 55 years today. So, but that presupposes that the ownership is going to continue to maintain the property so that we can be proud to call it a Four Seasons product. One single hotel that does not operate at the same standard as the rest is, is a huge problem for a company that only has 69 hotels. You know, each hotel is enormously important to the group. So this obsession with product and this passion for doing the right thing all the time also has a very uh, important uh, side to it, which is the brand is enormously important. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. Thank you. Uh, two, two more things. Uh, one, I don't forget the 2.30 to 4 uh, seminar this afternoon. Uh, as is customary, we do have something for you. Or maybe it's not customary, since he likes to, he probably would tell you to keep painting. <laughs> but we... We do have a plaque that we would like to present to you. It states, Ignacio Gomez Tobar, Eric Hilton Chair, Distinguished Lecture Series, January 26, 2006, signed by Dean John Bowen and yours truly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We, have, we want you to stand over here. Thank you. And we'd like you to turn this way. And we have one other thing that you can't look. Oh. You aren't supposed to look. So I've been given instructions. Now you have what? to trust me. This is something you do in human resource management. You're an expert in that. Your company is. You have to have faith. Is that correct? Total. So move back just a little bit and sit down. Sit down. Oh. <laughs> Now? <laughs> we have two former Eric Hilton Chair Distinguished Lecturers that we always like to have them come up and shake your hand also. <laughs> and Dorothy Nicholson and Nick Massett. Good job. Good job. And you will be receiving a chair that you just were seated. You will be receiving. Oh, this is fabulous. <laughs> What's your name on it? Oh, that is lovely. Thank you so much. So, oh, it's great. I could, I could sit in the lobby in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for attending and uh, thank you. if you'd like to